let me move this because I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story out of Genesis. Who who is the character we've been talking about lately? Um, no. God. <laughs> Stop guessing. <laughs> <laughs> who remembers who we've been talking about? Abraham. Thank you. Is his name Abraham yet? Yep, Abram. There you go. Okay. So his name's Abram still, right? It hasn't changed? Okay. So um, we've talked about God calling Abram. We've talked about some promises. We've talked about um, him going into Egypt. We've talked about him telling a fib. We've, right? Okay. And who did he take with him when he left? Who, who went with him? Do you remember? Lot and his wife Sarah. So Abram's wife Sarai, right? She's not Sarai yet. She's Sarai. So we have Abram, Sarai, and Lot, right? And what did Lot? With last time we talked about Abram and Lot, what did Lot do? Lot chose the best for himself. They were quarreling. Remember, Lot and Abram were they were quarreling, and so Lot's shepherds were quarreling with Abram's shepherds and Abram went and said let's not do this right we're delayed let's not do this so he says here's all the land before you right here's all the land before you choose what you want and Lot chose look at all that beautiful green see the Dead Sea right here can you see it see the Dead Sea see all that beautiful green all of this was beautiful and he's like I want that because that's good for sheep, right? <coughs> he didn't even split the good with his uncle, who let him choose. God didn't promise it to Lot, did he? He promised it to Abram. Okay, so that's where we left. And so a Lot went off, and he, and he was living near the city of what? Do you remember the name of the city? Sodom? Sodom? Okay. He went to go live near there. And Sodom was just north of the Dead Sea, right at the top of the, right at the top of the Dead Sea, is where Sodom was. Okay. Okay. So, Sodom is a city, and there was another city, Amora, and each city had a king. It's not like a country now, where a country has a king. In these times, every city had a king, a ruler. Okay. Today we call them like mayors, but they had a little bit more power than a mayor. Okay, and they had armies and soldiers and commerce. Okay, they were rulers. Right. So the cities of Sodom and Amora and a couple others, several others, had to pay what's called tribute to another king who was more powerful. Right. So way up in the north, way, way. In the north was a really powerful king. And he had three friends who were just as powerful. Okay? So together there were an alliance of four. And so Sodom and Amora had to pay, and other cities had to pay tribute. That means they had to pay like taxes. We don't like taxes. Do we like taxes? Do your parents don't like taxes, right? We hate We don't like taxes. So they had to pay a tribute, taxes, to this king. And for 12 years, they did it faithfully. They sent their tribute, whether it's sheep, gold, land, fruit, produce, we don't know what it was, but they sent it to the king, way up in the north. But in the 13th year, they said, we're not going to do it anymore, and they rebelled. Sometimes, you know, we talk about rebellion is not a good thing. Sometimes rebellion, as rebellion against unbiblical things, I think I'm going to have to come up with another word, but we use the word rebellion. That would be, and okay, sometimes it's being called obstinate. I can be the most obstinate person you've ever met in your life. Because if I dig my heels in, meaning, right, if somebody's dragging you, do you put your toes down? No, because you're going to go forward. But if you dig your heels in, I'm, I'm firm, right? Okay, so I will dig my heels in. Good luck moving me. I've been called obstinate or rebellious. Well, against your unjust, ungodly things, yes. 
I am. So when we use that term, it's not always a negative, okay? But if you're being rebellious against your parents, that is a negative. <coughs> Just saying, okay? Just saying. You don't want me to rock you. All right. So this king said, no more in the 13th year. And the kings up in the north, there were how many of them? Four. Hmm. They had soldiers and an army. And they said, okay, so in the 14th year, they came and they moved down and they started attacking and bringing back into submission, right, under my authority, my control, a whole bunch of places. One of them was the Rephaim. You've heard me talk about Rephaim before. Do you remember that the Rephaim are giants? Fierce. Okay? It's like a mountain. It's something that's in my way. It's an obstacle. So the Rephaim are there. Well, guess what? These kings conquered the Rephaim. They're warriors. And they conquered parts of Amalekites. Some of the other tribes in the Canaan area. Remember, it's Canaan. It's not Israel yet, right? And so they conquered. They're warriors, right? And then they came to Sodom and Gomorrah, or we say Sodom and Gomorrah, and they said, okay, and they were coming after them. But around there, there's these big pits, and we actually drove by them. Do you remember seeing some of those pits when they pointed them out? Okay, so there, there was, there's pits along the Dead Sea, and there's also sinking pits. Well, there were clay pits around Sodom and Gomorrah. And then to this side over here, you've got hills here, and you've got hills here. So they're living in the valley. So when they came and they got invaded, they decided some people started running. Some people fell in the pits. They're called clay pits. And some people went and fled to the hills. And those that didn't fall in the pits and those that didn't make it to the hills, everything, so that if they weren't in the clay pits and they weren't in the hills, these kings, these four kings, took them and captured them. And then they went to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they took all their possessions and all their food supplies and everything they owned in people that didn't escape, didn't fall in the pits and didn't escape to the hills. And then they took them all the way up past Damascus, way up there off my map. So it was four kings against five kings, but the Rephaim were giants and they beat them. Somebody escaped and came over to here, Hebron, and told Abram, the Ever. Remember Ever, the one who crossed over? That's where we get Ivrit, which is Hebrew, the one who crossed over. That's where the term comes from. It's the first time we see it. Okay, Ever, Ivrit, Hebrew. And they told Abram, your nephew Lot got taken by these kings. Now remember when Abram went over here and he was afraid for his life because of his wife? Well, if you want to know the true character of somebody, get them when they're under pressure. Get them when they have no, they don't have time to think. They can't make, they can't take a day to pray about it or 24 hours or 36 hours and they can't call and convene a war room tomorrow or next week so you can decide what to do. You've got to make a choice right now. That's when your true character comes out. What do you think Abram did? Let me tell you. He only had 318 men, fighting men. He's not a king of the city. And these, he's going to go after them. And he's going to go get his nephew Lot. And so Abram takes 318 men and says, we're going. And he goes all the way up past Damascus and fights those four ginormous kings and their armies in their own turf, on their own land. And he wins. Do you think he was outnumbered? Yeah, four kings who beat the giants 
and all these other people. I, you know, he went up against at least a thousand. If four kings had as many as he had, three hundred, which I think they had more, because the city is huge. Okay, so there's got to be well over a thousand experienced warriors. And here's Abram, who left her as like maybe a merchant, a rich man, and a nomad, a traveler, who at one point was afraid for his life because of his beautiful wife. And he goes off with 318 men against all of those seasoned warriors. And he takes all the people and all the possessions that they took, and he comes back. So what kind of character did he show? Really? Courage, bravery, courage, strength. Was he afraid? No. No. Sometimes we call that righteous anger. And so his character was, this is wrong, and I'm going to go make it right. Was God with him? Yeah. Yeah. Did Abram... He had to walk with God before he did this, though, didn't he? And he's been listening, and he's been obeying, right? Okay, you can still have character flaws. You know, when he went to Egypt with his wife, you can still have things that you don't have to be a perfect individual to do the right thing, all right? If you're waiting to be perfect, it's never going to happen. Never, never, never going to happen, okay? Not going to happen. But did he go in his own strength? No, there's 318 men. God had to be with him, right? Okay. So when you go to do something that's right and you know to do good, you do it. Remember who's there with you, okay? All right. Make sure, though, you're making the right choices, okay? You can't decide to do something selfish or something for your own reasons and expect God to save you or be with you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, God isn't like a genie in a bottle that grants your wishes. But if you try, if you read, and you try to be his like Abram did, and you serve him, flaws and all, mistakes and all, mm -hmm. he will not leave you, he will not forsake you. What did I tell you girls last night? About God. Does he sleep? Nope. No. He never sleeps, never slumbers. He's always watching. Okay? Always watching. Now, what does a good shepherd do at night? Do you remember? Watch. Yeah, but what does he do in particular? He puts the sheep in a safe spot. And what does he do? He puts himself. He puts himself at the most vulnerable place where somebody can come, right? So that he protects and guards and guides, right? Mm. When we were in Israel, I saw a dog. It could very well have been in Antolian. It was so far away. All I could see was the dog on a hill. And I looked up and I thought, wow, that dog's up there on that hill all by himself. I wonder why. And then my eyes moved down the hill and across the ravine to another shorter hill, and here's all the sheep. And from that great distance, he was watching the sheep. But he wasn't anywhere near them. He wasn't anywhere near them. But he could go charging down that hill and nothing flat and save them because he could see the enemy from wherever he was, and he'd have made it down there. They could run fast, right? He could have made it to protect the sheep. And that's what God does. He stands way up high where we not necessarily see him or feel him or know him, and he watches. He was watching over Abram, and Abram's true character was one of boldness and courage and doing. Okay? Have good character. Yeah?